star of Lord of the Rings, Game of Thrones, and sharp, immortal actor Sean Bean. And you're listening to True Up Stories. You bastards. Welcome back to another festive, well, not an, well, another festive Trope Stormers podcast with myself, Jim Kahlberg, and the man who puts the Chris in Christmas, Christopher Jeeves. Actually, I think it's probably someone else who puts the Chris in Christ, the Christ of Christmas. I, but that, that name escapes me at the minute. Um, but nevertheless, I'm here with my good pal, Chris Jeeves, and we're here to talk a Christmas film here on wow. Trope Stormers. That was quite an intro. I mean, you're right. I do put the Chris in Christmas. I have since 1984. How are you doing, man? Are you? Uh, are you? I'm trying to rescue you here from your uh, rather bombastic intro there. Um, how are you doing, Mr. Jim Carberg? Are you all settled for this uh, rather strange instalment of Christmas? I'm good. Uh, yeah, it's it's going to be an odd one, isn't there? There's still, as usual, um, presents wrapped, ready to go for people. I'm not seeing my um, immediate family this year which is is quite sad um but yeah i guess it's one of those isn't it we, you know the idea of to save future christmases we've got to sacrifice this one somewhat i'm sure there's like a link for like christmas future and we could have like made a thing of uh, a christmas carol with like past present future but i think we're past that now yeah more lit- a more literary more enlightened uh bunch of people might have been able to make some sort of highbrow allusions to that but we'll just stick to chris sounds a bit like christmas for now yeah i mean we know what we are um yeah no i, I know what you mean man i'm um, i'm not going to be with my immediate family i'm doing my first christmas with the uh partner's family so yeah i mean I've, we've got an outrageous amount of booze and i'm basically going to bury my face in a bowl of pigs and blankets so i'll be like a pig and poop it's gonna be great whatever gets you through and that does sound pretty good i've got to admit uh yeah i might try and eat that um with uh I'm a, I'm a sucker for a mince pie i used to hate them as a kid um but now you just hook it up to my veins you know just get that <laughs> <laughs> just blend blend it down and inject it straight in intravenous like mince Mm-mm-mm. i was in a bank uh, at school once <laughs> <laughs> all right well you're like a, a sort of post-punk sort of thing is that what that was yeah we were a bit late to the party on that one but uh yeah, we, I, I digress. Um, I, you can tell it's Christmas. Um, we know we're letting our sort of guard down and, uh, and 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 starting to drift from the task at hand, which is. I mean, the pod's barely started and we've gone down a tangent already. Yeah, intravenous mints. Good, intravenous good, mints. That's good. God, let's uh, let's row back to shore. Um, let's lighthouse this mother. Yes, uh, we are doing uh, what is unquestionably beyond doubt, most definitely is a Christmas film. That's There's not no because some, I've noticed some podcasts are doing that. Is is it? It's the discussion about this. Is it a Christmas film or not? And you know, the the, the case for it being a Christmas film is staggering. I would argue. I mean, it features Run DMC's Christmas in Hollis and uh, Let It Snow. So I mean, it's got two Christmas films and it's set at a Christmas party. Yeah. So you know, no further questions, my lud. You know, and also, you know, that Christmas party also features a lot of blatant casual drug use and uh, office space canoodling. So, I mean, what's more Christmas than that? You know, and, and we need that in the absence of it this this time of year with uh, with the, what's going on in the world. You know, this that would yeah. be there'd be all that plus photocopied asses, you know, ties on heads uh, across offices across the land. And, uh, you know, sadly, that's not going to be a thing. Uh, this yeah. year so we thought drunken attempts for minions to uh or bosses to kind of you know get in with the cool kids at work you know be one of one of the everyday people don't think of me less as your boss and more as your friend i don't know some rubbish like that chilled out entertainer alluded a little bit there as to what film we are looking at today and if i don't know how far you want to go with your hints here but in german this film would very badly translate as the hard well i don't i that is uh, as cryptic as it gets at this point <laughs> <laughs> in proceedings but yeah it is none other than the definitive ultimate christmas film bruce willis vehicle john mcclain yippee ki himself die hard happy trails um yeah, um, but look, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Um, what are we here to do, Mr. Jim Carberg? 
Well, we're here to trope storm it, aren't we? Which doesn't mean, I mean, we let's let's put cards on the table. I think it's pretty evident we like this film, but we don't do things necessarily that we like. Like and dislike does not come into the the, the, the trope storming game. So, what what are we here to do? Oh uh, well, we're we're here for a straight best of four shootout, uh, where we're going to basically analyse this film for the tropes that are inherent within it. Uh, we're going to pick two tropes a piece, and we're going to explore those. If you're new to the game, uh, where have you been? We've got lots of amazing pods, please check them out. Uh, a trope is a narrative device used to aid a story. And we are gonna check whether these devices that feature are used for the purposes of good, they are utropian, or they are lazy, ham-fisted, and shoehorned in to try and help the plot along. They're stereotypical and cliched, they're dystropian. As we say, it's a best of four, we don't do draws, so if in the event it's a tie, we'll have a sudden death shootout with our auxiliary trope. Clear as mud? I thought so. Let's trope storm. Yeah, and, and just to, just to go in with a sort of Christmas example, I suppose, um, I've got thinking about franchises, that which is the last um, podcast that we did. If you haven't uh, listened to that, go go check that out. Uh, plenty uh, diehard talk, in fact. And also, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, lots of lots of your favourite um, franchises that will no doubt appear over Christmas um in various guises um but yeah one i was thinking was the one actual rare christmas franchise in particular is the santa claus trilogy um if you've ever seen that chris is that um, who's who's the lead in that it's not billy bob thornton is it it's uh, if i say that it's a bit of a oh, it's tim allen. yeah tim allen uh you, that's one of your finer impressions i'll give you that thanks mate thanks mate yeah I'll, i've uh, successfully worked it into the last podcast and i'm you know i'm running with it um, I wonder if you're on the payroll somewhere for Tim Allen. <laughs> well, there's, there's actually, I think there's, there's speaking of, uh, of another Santa Claus movie being in the uh, the offing, but it's kind of a, just to go along with that, along with sort of things like Scrooge, it's kind of like a, a take on the sort of Christmas Carol redemption arc at Christmas of, uh, you know, somebody who's very um, materialistic and, um, you know, obsessed with money and, and not really in the, the spirit of Christmas or family. Um, has to then is forced to take on v via, uh, you know, v being visited by spirits or in this situation, killing Santa and then becoming Santa. Um, yeah, is then forced That's to pretty... try and think about the spirit of Christmas. I mean, as a film, it's a, it's really weird. Uh, it's pretty dark. Does he intend to kill Santa or is it like a, an accident? Well, he scares him and he falls off the roof. And the Santa Claus with an E is that he, you know, if you kill Santa, you become Santa. So... You know, there's a, there's a horror film waiting to happen there. I feel. I mean, that is bizarre. Or is a this kind a of children's film. Uh, children will have watched it. Yeah, I watched it as a child, and I t I turned out fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're totally uh, well adjusted. So after that abysmal description of what a trope is, uh, and but that idea of the redemption arc of a character over the Christmas period is well trodden ground. So let's get into Die Hard well, itself. Like, yeah, yeah like it's a wonderful life. Yeah, yeah, which is. A, a absolutely fantastic Christmas film. It is. Definitely watch that one. Um, cool. So, Die Hard. So, this was directed by John McTiernan, who I thought I'd heard of, but wasn't really sure. And then I did a little bit of digging, and he has some fair directorial chops. I'll give him that. Um, before this, there was Predator. Yeah. Then he did Die Hard. Then there was The Hunt for Red October, which features Sean Connery's fantastic Russian accent, by which I mean he just did it with a Scottish accent. <laughs> on a, on a, playing in a Russian uniform. In a Russian uniform, playing a Russian submarine commander. Um, Last Action Hero, uh, Die Hard with a Vengeance, and The Thomas Crown Affair, and also Rollerball, which I haven't seen. But, you know, not a, fa a bad um, bad little run there. Um, he managed to avoid doing Predator 2, which was a car crash. Um, Die Hard 2, also another car crash. Um, yeah, fair play to a man. Done pretty well. He strikes while the iron's hot. I mean... Rollerball, I can only assume, is about um, underarm aerosols, uh, non-aerosols. Um, yeah, I think it was like sponsored by Sure. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, um, I'm sure he did a, a cracking job of making that into an exciting film. Um, this was also um, Bruce Willis's first foray into like a major lead acting role. He was actually kind of known as a com comedic sort of TV actor uh, from the series Moonlighting, which I don't think really aired in the UK, but he co-starred alongside Sybil Shepherd in a sort of comedy detective agency um, series. 
and they were he wasn't really taken seriously for the, the lead role in this initially he was actually barely even third choice for the role so i mean i i, I guess a big part of the, the the character which we'll get into of john mcclain is who's the, the the lead is is his charisma i suppose isn't it and he's he's one-liners and he's uh he's kind of he's quite a sassy character isn't he really um yeah well, he's, he's just a sort of your typical new york city cop isn't he he's, he's take take no uh crap from anybody and uh wisecracking sort of answer for everything tough tough as old boots um yeah i think mean, he plays it pretty well um he was also paid an unprecedented five million dollars for this which at the time was unheard of and was signed off by none other than uh, Rupert Murdoch of 20th Century Fox himself. Oh, it's not all bad then. It's no, <laughs> he gives away $5 million. He's, he's great. It's like a charity case. What, what a guy. Um, bizarre, what, what a guy. Uh, bizarrely, the producers were contractually ob obliged to offer the role, first of all, to Frank Sinatra because uh, of a uh, previous movie Wait, it was what? tied up. What? Yeah. <laughs> Frank Sinatra, who was 73 at the time, legally had to be offered first choice on the role. He turned it down. But imagine, imagine Yippie Kaye uh, delivered by Old Blue Eyes. It'd be like clicking, and then you know you'd have a a, a dicky bow, you know, instead of a vest, just loosely. <laughs> he wouldn't be able to do the grubby vest because he's he's just not allowed to ever have a hair out of place. He's just going to look dapper the entire time just or... constantly trying to balance his martini <laughs> yeah. he, he just wouldn't get in that air vent would he the duck <laughs> team he just just wouldn't it's not going to happen or he'd be in a black tux or he'd be in a white tux and it would become a black tux and the dirt would be the black tux but it would just be a black tux yeah that would be yeah. my thoughts well i'm glad he t i'm glad to hear he turned it down you know he's uh, not i can't imagine him swinging through uh <laughs> through a window uh in in that situation no, and uh, once once they'd got the uh, thumbs down from Frank, uh, they also got the thumbs down from Sylvester Stallone, Harrison Ford, De Niro, Mel Gibson, Richard Gere, Burt Reynolds. Bruce Willis was not first choice to make this, yet he still got the five mil. He must have one hell of an agent, the Carlsberg of agents. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I could see I could see Mel Gibson uh, actually, because you know he's, he's sort of lethal weapon. Yeah, uh, but would he just play it too rigsy? He'd be a bit unhinged. Well, I guess that's what they were asking for, weren't they? Really? Um, and and, and McLean's pretty—he's pretty, he's pretty uh, maverick. Yeah, yeah, he sort of keeps it together more. And I mean, I don't know. I mean, those films—those films were made at a very similar time. I don't know if you know another cop mullet is required. Well, it's, it's nice to see a receding hairline on a on a, a character uh, in this. It's kind movie. of weird, though. He looks a bit like your uncle, doesn't he? In this, <laughs> I mean, the man looks he cuts a great figure in a vest. He, you know, not a lot of people wouldn't look that good in a vest. I'm just saying, you know, what we've got here, Rav C. Nesbitt is uh, probably our famous <laughs> vest wearer. Uh, and you know, he, he kind of he doesn't really compare, does he, in comparison? I would say this is this is the, the simply the vest, if you like. Um, oh, whoa, 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 horses for courses here, Jim. I mean, I would counter that by saying that Bruce Willis in a string vest watching telly and swigging Iron Brew just wouldn't, you know, he couldn't pull that off. Okay, okay. Well, it's a good job to the Atlantic's between them because, you know, there's not enough room for them both, clearly. Whilst touching on said vest, um, in my research, I found out that in 2007, Bruce Willis donated the vest to the Smithsonian Museum. It's now an exhibit at one of America's most prestigious museums. Like they've got like space shuttles and all sorts in that museum and John McClane's vest. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you go there and you haven't seen the film, it's going to be, I would imagine it's quite a disappointing exhibit. <laughs> <laughs> What's this? Some grubby vest. <laughs> What's special about it? Is it, you know, can it survive the, the cold of space? Does it, uh, you know, does it keep warm? Does it really repel bullets? Yeah. Um, you know, did Neil Armstrong wear it on his first moon landing? No, it's just Bruce Willis's vest. Uh, <laughs> Say no more. I understand completely why this is here. Now, please get out of my way whilst I bow down. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, like you're saying about this is this is a, a real breakthrough uh, role for him, really, isn't it? And he, he, it's it's you think Bruce Willis, you think Die Hard, don't you? 
and it's uh, it's it, it's as simple as that. It is a franchise that he's very much tied up in. Um, it spawned many sequels to varying degrees of uh, artistic success and merit. Um, the third one, Die Hard with a Vengeance, I rewatched recently, and that is still holds up as a great action film. The other one's less so, in my humble opinion. But it was also, um, it wasn't just a vehicle for old Brucey. Um, this uh, was the first Hollywood fe- and feature film debut of Alan Rickman. I mean, talk about agents uh, getting good gigs. The, 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 you know, I, the, the, the job lot on Alan, uh, Rickman and, and Brucey on this one because that that's some wow. going to go from basically this this to be your first kind of movie vehicle and the, the character that you have. We talked about the hero a little bit, you know, being this kind of slightly slightly deadbeat but slightly conf, you know confident, uh, capable fish out of water new york cop in la and then to have you know this gentleman villain uh character that's become so iconic is just uh it, it's a it's really good to see to, to, to see the interplay between them and see the chemistry uh that, that forms with, with this movie i think they, they took a bit of a punt though because you think about it like on paper if you're a big studio with a budget behind this you're hiring a guy who's basically been in a kind of light-hearted sort of primetime comedy uh, detective agency show, a la Miami Vice. Bruce Willis also did appear in an episode of Miami Vice, by the way. Um, and some British bloke who's mainly known for TV and theatre work, who's never done a film in his life. It's quite sort of, they've, uh, they took a risk on this one. And um, apparently, uh, like Brucey, Alan wasn't first in line for the call. They wanted Sam Neill of Jurassic Park fame. Um, and he turned it down. He didn't want to be Hans Gruber, and the world is a better place for it. In my yeah, opinion. yeah, I agree. I know, you know, mad, mad props to to Sam Neill, but uh, yeah, but well done. It's like it's the the Sean Connery Gandalf situation all over again for me. This, you know, him him stepping Wait, what? Yeah, originally Sean Connery was supposed to be Gandalf, uh, and then he he <laughs> he looked at the script and said, "The Lord of the Rings just it was stupid." <laughs> and, you know, it did make sense, I think, was the quote. Um, Sometimes you you do wonder, you know, it gives you little little moments that think maybe maybe things do happen for a reason. Because, like, can you think of anyone other than Ian McCallum being Gandalf now? It's kind of unthinkable. And I think you, that, you've got that situation here with, with uh, Hans. Yeah, and it was kind of by... Uh, chance that they happened upon Alan Rickman at all. Apparently the producers saw him um, doing a play Dangerous Liaisons and he was amazing in that and they basically cast him off the back of that. So they just happened to see him in a play. It wasn't because he was like making huge waves. You know, his agent wasn't out and about being like, yeah, gotta hire this guy. Um, Yeah. Right place, right time, right uh, vehicle. And what about the sort of uh, further supporting cast that we've got? I mean, what what is this about what is the what is the the, the dramatis personae that fill in around our villain our hero well i mean if you're talking like the basic premise i mean it's your sort of classic heist and siege movie combined kind of under siege meets oceans 11 if you will the two sort of like melded together um you've got our lead who is bruce willis who's on the way to a christmas party at the invitation of his estranged wife and uh, the Christmas party is being held in a swanky big building, and uh, a, a bunch of German slash European, pan European German, with a, a token Asian man thrown in for good measure, um, storm in, uh, take them all hostage, and uh, are basically threatening to blow up the building unless their demands are met. And Bruce Willis, who is an off duty police officer, is caught in the middle of all of this. There are parallels with It's a Wonderful Life if you look for them, but it's not immediate. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you might have to sort of scratch around below the surface, but, you know, they reward, you know, scratch around deeper and you'll, you will be rewarded. Um, I'm just picturing Jimmy I mean, Stewart in this role now, in the vest. Just going, sorry. He, it would be such a different film. Like, it would be more in the Frank Sinatra mold. Like, again, don't see him sort of getting sort of grubby and 
uh, sort of going through a, a vent duct. It's not really his, his scene. Yeah, well, he'd, he'd try and out-charm um, Hans Gruber, I reckon. They'd just have a charm off, and it just wouldn't go anywhere. And they'd probably just go for a pint or something, call it all off. <laughs> I'd watch that. Yeah, I'd watch the shit out of that. Um, yeah, so in terms of other characters, the sort of main other players, um, I kind of feel like there are quite a lot of other characters, but they all sort of, they're all bit part. As the, other, the only ones that really come close is his sort of remote buddy cop figure, if you will, which is a flat-footed uh, patrol police officer who he strikes up a friendship outside over the radio. And this is kind of his line of communication to the outside world whilst the um, bank robbers are doing their business. Um, and you've got sort of like a journalistic hack who's sort of floating around as well, trying to sort of dig up dirt. Uh, and then you've got various layers of sort of police and FBI who are kind of uh, bumblingly incompetent in trying to sort of retake the building. Yeah, yeah, it's quite, they're just like, don't know how to use their own equipment or they don't have any sort of idea of tactics whatsoever <laughs> of, of, of what's going on uh, throughout various points and cue lots of eye rolling from, uh, is it uh, Al Powell, who's the... Al Powell, yeah. yeah. You know, who's the, cop. the one who's two days from retirement or whatever, and he's, uh, you know, he's, he's got a. That he's bringing the up. sass. He's bringing the sass hard. What I also love about uh, just whilst we got we've got quite a lot of henchmen in this. Um, obviously, we've got kind of the the big bad and the dragon, which we'll touch on later. But there is a a, plef- a smorgasbord of bit part goons who it seems like they're meant to all be German. But the quality of their German and the scripting of the German is, well, it's amateur at best, basically. Uh, my, I watched this with my partner who studied German when she was younger, and she was kind of eye-rolling herself at just how awful some of the dialogue is. I mean, at one point, Hans Gruber says to one of his henchmen something in German and then clarifies what he said in English because the guy didn't seem to follow, which doesn't make any sense whatsoever since German was meant to be their mother tongue. Yeah, that's a bit, almost a bit break the fourth wall, that kind of thing. It's like, you have to let the audience know what you are saying. <laughs> if I said it's the German accent, yeah. <laughs> I don't know why it always gets camp whenever I do German. You get away with that with Rickman. Yeah, I mean, he plays it quite camp. Um, but only a couple of the actors who played the German terrorists were actually German. Most of them were actually American and just putting on awful German accents and the dialogue that they were given. Apart from uh, Wilhelm von Homburg, you know who I'm talking about here? I do, yeah. Who uh, played, he was one of the goons, but he was also Vigo in Ghostbusters 2. And for our audience, yes, that is a funny looking dude who comes out of a painting. I think he's a bit of a bad bloke in real life as well, by all accounts, but I won't pick at that thread too much. Well, he's he's dead. he's dead now, so yeah. Well, yeah. Well, it's yeah. We'll uh, we'll leave that there. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's sidestep that one and move on. He's dead now. Who won, really? Uh, where are we at? Probably should get into the tropes at some point. Yeah, we can kick on to a trope. Do you wanna do you wanna kick off, or shall I kick off? Uh, what the hell's Midsummer Night's Dream thing? Uh, yeah, so originally it was going to be spread over three days, but he was going to, he was inspired by Midsummer Night's Dream to just do it over one day. I think Midsummer Night's Dream is meant to be set over the course of 24 hours or something. I mean, that's as deep as that uh, nugget of information went. <laughs> it's no more, it's no more profound than that, but I'm sure the director at dinner party was, as was quick to say, Oh, yes, you know, Shakespeare influenced this one. What, Die Hard? Yeah, yeah, I was really influenced by Midsummer Night's Dream. I was reading it at the time. And, uh, yeah, some of the ideas really, really stuck with me. Uh, yeah, you know, bottom, uh, he, he crops up trying to figure out which character is bottom. Hmm. You know, some I know, bollocks like that. <laughs> All right then. So do you want do you want to start with the the action man? Every man's quite a good one, I think. To start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can. Um, cool. So it's time to get trope storming, and my first trope for 
this podcast for Die Hard is I'm focusing in on the big the big guy himself, Bruce Wayne, aka John McClane. And I'm looking at him as your kind of Bruce Wayne. action man. Did I say Bruce Wayne? Yeah, you got your I think the your, your rhyme scheme got in the way a bit there. Oh no. I think I got sort of caught between Bruce Willis, John McClane, and went Bruce Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that didn't go very well, did it? Oh, I'm sure that'll make the bloopers. Um, yeah, that's the end bit. That's the end bit sorted. Oh, I can breathe a sigh of relief. You know, because there's something pretty dumb to uh, drop the stage that I'm sure we'll manage. Well, looks like it's time for Chris's first drop. Right, so without further ado, it's time to storm some tropes. And my first trope is going to be focusing in on the main character, Bruce Willis, a.k.a. John McClane and how he is portrayed in the typical action man sense. Or is he? Uh, I think he's a bit more of an everyman in this. He's kind of a guy who's kind of caught in the wrong place at the wrong time, but he kind of has the skill set to make it work, being a New York City police officer. Um, so if we think of him in your sort of 80s action hero, and this is a podcast, one of our bolts that we did previously, we talk extensively about 80s action heroes. So I'm going to go by our metrics from that and see how he matches up. Are you ready, Jim? Oh, yeah, I'm racking my brains back from that. So, yeah, I'd be interested to hear. OK, um, so let's let's do a tick box exercise here, see how he, he measures up. Uh, OK, he is male. I call that a tick. American. Mm, tick. Caucasian, yeah, uh, doesn't have a buzz cut. Uh, I'd say receded hair, but sure, does is a bit stubbly. Oh, this one, a big tick here. Usually a former police officer or soldier. Very rarely an active service. Well, he's he's a current member of the uh, NYPD. Uh, what else have we got? Uh, <laughs> will fight dirty. I think uh, his run-in with Carl is a testament to that. Um, Little respect for authority sounds good. Tendency to use one liners. Well, yippee ki yay, motherfucker. Yes. Yeah. Well, that, that, that's it pretty much, you know, the lion's share of the box is ticked in that sense. You know, he does, he does fit those. But you kind of inferred that he, he had, there was some sort of subtlety to, to that. And, you know, he's not the, the sort of invincible, uh, you know, man mountain kind of, uh, one man army, is he, that, uh, you often find in 80s action tropes. Well, no, I mean, physically, I mean, he cuts a fine figure in a vest. We've already talked about that. But yeah, he's not like ripplingly muscle bound. He's not giant in his stature. He has got that sort of every man. He's got the believability that he is just a guy who was at the wrong party. When a bunch of uh, European bank robbers descend, gate crashed it. So he has that and he's fallible as well. Um He's not a one-man wrecking ball. Um, he's pretty fallible. He, you know, detonates a load of C4 and takes out most of the ground floor of a building. I think more by accident than by design. He uh, gets his feet cut to, sh to ribbons, bleeds a lot, and uh, hobbles about a lot. He also gets the crap beaten out of him by one of the uh, German goons um, in an extended and rather brutal sort of fight sequence. Um, and he's also he's a guy who. Uh, He's gone to this party at the uh, at the invitation of his estranged wife, and their relationship is very much on the ropes. And you know the strains are there to see. They have basically a, a full blown argument within within him being in the building for five minutes. He's he's fallible. He's a quite a well drawn, believable character, but flawed. And he's you know he's not a martial artist. He's not a sharpshooter. He doesn't have a ridiculous big gun. He can't doesn't have any magical powers. Um, and he doesn't have Gulf War syndrome or anything like that, or you know, he hasn't been exposed to a huge amount of gamma radiation or whatever. Um, yeah, I mean, he's just in a vent with a lighter at one point, is he? Just sort of like lamented his life. Mm. Uh, and that is such a, an iconic shot, that one as well. That, that's one that I think was used extensively for the marketing purposes. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely something that's uh, visually quite interesting, but also. You know, conveys the character quite well, I think. Um, so yeah, it's 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 an interesting one, isn't it? Because I, I we tend to root for people we can relate to a little bit more. I remember in in uh, Dolph Lundgren in a film, which was it was like Masters of the Universe, so it was something ridiculous like that. But like the He-Man character in that is literally just 
a muscly guy who just chins people all the time. And I think Courtney like, Cox in that. She a very young Courtney Cox, yeah, yeah. Um, so she she's in that. I mean, it's a much it's a much worse film. But in terms of you know this this it's what springs to mind when I think I've got this you've, you've got this hero you need to root for who's literally just a set of muscles, uh, and he's he's just I, I like Dolph Lundgren, but he's just completely uninteresting in that uh, in that particular role. Um, yeah, you know, he's supposed to be the, the 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 action figure that everyone got from that movie, and he's supposed to be the person that kind of hang the movie on that. And I think in terms of kind of the type of sort of hero that he sort of portrays, he sort of straddles a fine line between moments of being quite badass and also being like more of the sort of survivor. Like he's thrown into this, and to begin with, he's sort of he's on the he's trying to hide and evade them, and then he sort of gets a grip on the situation and starts trying to sort of be the fly in the ointment and ruin all of their plans. But yeah, he he makes mistakes along the way and. I think, you know, it's done in a way that you could you could almost see yourself being in that role, but probably to a far less successful. I mean, this all goes back to, you know, what have you got around you for the uh, the advent of the zombie apocalypse? Like if we were John McClane, I think I wouldn't last five minutes. That'd be, that'd be that scene at the beginning where that guy's kind of like, you might as well come out. I promise I won't hurt you. And I'll be like, oh, cool. Hey, how you doing? And then that's me. I'm done. You know, I would have been gullible enough to fall for that. Good, good body credentials established with scenes like that, isn't it? When you have the, the, the kind of, you know, let's establish what mor- moral compass these people have. None whatsoever. Yeah, and it's a, it's a real theme in the uh, the villains in this, which we'll 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 come on to. So he ticks he ticks every box um, in the 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 action man sense, but there's there's also that kind of vulnerability because he he is a he's easily a week in hospital after this. Uh, you know, it's all smiles at the end, but he is. What are we all about? He snogs his wife and goes off in the limo. Yeah, there's no suggestion of him going to hospital. He's he's off to you know sow so with wild oats or whatever. Well, he's he's getting his leg amputated or something afterwards. <laughs> there's some there's some sepsis going on somewhere. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, they could be gangrene. Sure, why not? You know, but he's a he's a he's a man's man. He ain't got time to bleed. And he's uh, he, he, it's interesting. He's got this kind of camaraderie, hasn't he, with the um, you know, he's, he's, he's not on his own. He's not on his own throughout this because uh, otherwise he's trying to just rely on his wits uh, on the on the corridors of the Nakatomi building. Um, so it, he, he does have some help, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. Well, it's help and hindrances as well because. Uh, Along the way, you also have, uh, well, the FBI and the police force uniting in their incompetence uh, and their various failed attempts to sort of infiltrate the building and take back control. And they actually actively try to discourage John McClane from actually any further help from the inside. They actually see him as a problem and that he's getting in the way of their plans. And then you also have um, <laughs> the Gordon Gecko-esque uh, fast talking lawyery banker type Ellis who uh, tries to make out that him and John are sort of best buds from the old days and winds up getting himself shot. Hans Booby. <laughs> Hans Booby, I'm your white knight. Um, yeah, and I mean, that must have been pretty. You think about that from like McLean the whole way through that conversation tries to save his life as much as he can from where he is. And uh, even the police force will try to blame him for that guy dying when it's it's the young guy's stupid fault for the sort of getting coked up and thinking that he could you know sweet talk a sociopathic um, German terrorist basically. So I mean, what's the point in his character? Because he's like uh, he's just a bit of a jerk ass, isn't he? He's just there, just like we're not supposed to really. <laughs> yeah, he spends a lot of time trying to sleaze onto McLean's wife unsuccessfully. Um, or sort of snorting a bit of blow left, right, and centre, and getting busted by his boss. Yeah, I, I guess maybe he's meant to sort of represent sort of an element of capitalist greed for sort of 80s, uh, loads of money, but obviously an American version, sort of a city boy, a bit sort of Wolf of Wall Street-esque character. Because I feel like there is a little bit of a kind of a subtext in this about sort of capitalism and corporate greed. Like Hans Gruber talks about it with uh, Nakatomi Corporation, um, 
it's alluded to on sort of Ellis talks about Japan sort of supplying cassette decks to everybody and uh yeah I kind of feel like there is they're sort of making a bit of a comment in the way that like the Robocop films had a sort of ironic parody element to them because I almost get the sense like by the time that Ellis meets his Mrs. Maker at the hands of uh hands of hands uh for, for want of a better f syntax there yeah we, we're almost kind of like that, that's like played for played for laughs a little bit yeah no it, it is sort of played for there's a sort of comedy element to it, but it's quite tragic at the same time as well. Because, I mean, in his in his own head, he's being sort of quite heroic, or he's actually just being really stupid and coked up. And I suppose that goes to serve like the, the fact that you've got the street smarts then in in uh, McLean um, being being the one who's actually you know the police are useless. The guys who are in the the, the building are, are you know are just are no good. They just get themselves killed. Therefore. Now it's time for McLean to shine and uh, you know do do his work his magic. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's interesting. I think that, that there's there's a lot of good interplay between the characters uh, in in this. I think some in some ways it's quite a um, quite cliched. Uh, there's you know you've got your that sort of quite obvious symbolism in the 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 kind of capitalist characters, Japanese businessmen, etc. But then and you've got like the you know, a, a black sidekick cop, um, and you know, an estranged uh, wife in a neurotic relationship, and then you've got the the, the card carrying villain. Um, it, yeah, there's, it, it's it's a weird one because in some ways it's really quite um, one note and, and 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 quite stereotypical. Um, but I don't know whether I'm looking at that retrospectively or with what's come since because you know, there's, that many films have copied this formula. Yeah, I think. Mean the characters do have sort of quite a lot of depth and actually in the research one thing that came to light was because Bruce Willis was filming this and still doing Moonlight which has a TV show you have quite a hectic schedule like filming episodes um, he was exhausted and apparently because of sort of levels of exhaustion and some of the physicality of this role um, they actually rewrote a lot of the script on the fly and bumped up the supporting characters so apparently originally Argyle, the limo driver, Officer Powell, who's his uh, buddy cop character, and I think Thornburg as well, the sort of journalist hack, all ha like ended up having much bigger, more fleshed out uh, roles and backstories. And I think that sort of comes to the fore a bit because of it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, they're, they're, that's, I think that's what I'm getting at, is they're all quite um, tried and tested character archetypes, but at the same time, they're quite well drawn. You, they're quite believable at each point. Um, so yeah, it's, um, it's interesting. You've got, you, you, you hit, they all sorts of serve this kind of hero, this, this, you know, he's a believable everyman for that reason. He has, he, he's able to interact with people on a human level. He's able to empathize with people in trouble whilst still being this kind of neurotic, grouchy, uh, everyman who, who, who just wants out, but, you know, kind of rises to the, the challenge of saving the day at the end. It's time for Jim's first trip. This idea of it being a Christmas movie, because obviously we've got the the, the 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 things that earmark it as a Christmas movie. So we've got the you know the music that's been played, uh, Christmas in Hollis, as well as um, Let It Snow, and then you've also got um, the, the the Christmas party, the kind of references to Christmas throughout of it, throughout it as well. But you know, d does it follow this kind of Santa Claus? Um, Christmas Carol type structure in some way. I mean, I don't want you to think about that. Does it, you know, you, you talked about depth and it having a message in one sense, but still being a Christmas film in, an, in another sense. Like, do you think it's got any sort of sort of deeper associations with Christmas alongside that? Uh, I mean, I think for a lot of people, they very loosely uh, cling to this being a Christmas film because it's set at Christmas, there are Christmassy elements, and it's kind of, it's, the idea of quite quite a violent action film um, being classified as a Christmas film is quite sort of comedic in and of itself. It's almost like ironically Christmassy because um, most of the themes explored, a lot of the themes explored in it are not Christmassy at all. You know, greed, capitalism, murder, violence. Um, and I think for maybe a lot of people, it's they, they embrace this as a Christmas film because it's such a contrast to the sort of saccharine, sugary, 
feel good miracle on 34th street you know stuff that we've been sort of spoon fed by well since you know it's fairy tales and the whole christmas narrative in and of itself it's almost like a welcome release in its sort of stark contrast to all of those things and i think that's why so many people rally towards it and embrace it and champion it as a christmas film because it's kind of like a two-finger salute to what people think a christmas film should be and it's all the more wonderful for it so that's quite a postmodern way of looking at it the idea of you know it's it's there's an irony to it um and like we said it's trying to make maybe make some sort of comment um i don't know if it's a bit more earnest than that you know you've got this kind of grouchy uh you know cynical cop um who by by the end of things is you know he's brought together with um with al and uh, holly by the end of things you know they've, they're kind of almost fully reconciled um and and kind of realized what matters you know the the, the character of alan in, in particular has got this this sort of strongly alluded to art that he's, he's shot somebody he shot a kid mm. uh yeah and there's the idea that he's you know th these people have got something to make right over christmas he's got, time he's got a bit of a redemp redemption arc going on hasn't he yeah, and there's kind of there's kind of a lot of that, I think. And it, when we really think about the contrast between characters like Ellis and uh, Gruber, obviously, but they they don't have any sort of real redeeming arc of their own. Um, they're kind of contrasted with these these characters who are supposed to be normal people at Christmas time, just trying to get on with Christmas, um, but also you know deal with the the shit that they've got going on in their lives. Um, and it, and and at the end of it. He does just walk off, doesn't he? he just, just get, you know, go, ends up in a limo, just having a, you know, reconciled with his with his wife, uh, McLean, and then, um, yeah, you know, there's 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 a, there's a, there's a feel good to it towards at the end, uh, and I, I don't know what you're talking about the idea of uh, capitalism and uh, greed not having anything to do with Christmas is just preposterous. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, there's no it's, violence it's, in your house <laughs> on a daily basis. Um, Life is violent. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, Christmas is an incredibly sort of corporate capitalist event. Um, you just need to look at Black Friday and what it brings out in people to see sort of worst elements that people can sort of portray. Um, and that that last fight for that um, pig in blanket, last pig in blanket or roasty in in my house is 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 absolutely demon. So that's the price. probably just as well I'm not going back this year. Uh, it's, no, it's not a fight mind of things. I mean, I... Nah. Just one-sided. Just one-sided. I mean, I have my own bowl. I can't fight myself for them, can I? <laughs> <laughs> that's, for, that's foresight, my friend. Yep. I take a totally Joey from Friends approach on that. You know, I do not share food. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess with the whole sort of Die Hard and Is It a Christmas Film, you're right, because sort of the more um, benevolent characters do come through it well you know uh agent power gets his sort of redemption uh john mcclain gets reunited with his estranged wife and uh all of the hostages go apart from takagi who's killed but maybe you could argue that he's the price of capitalism along with ellis um all the bad guys die without exception i think um a lot of them die in quite awful ways um Speaking of deaths, we haven't touched on uh, Hans Gruber's death, which is one of my favourite trivia uh, nuggets of knowledge, um, which I'm sure I've bored you with, but I'm going to bore everybody else. I might even have mentioned this on the podcast before. Yeah, I think it came up, but yeah, it, for for clarification, it is brilliant. Hmm. I, I, it's Christmas. I get another another go, uh, another swing at this. Um, the scene where Hans Gruber uh, is hanging out of the Nakatomi building clinging on to uh, Bruce Willis as John McClane's wife's wrist. And there's also quite a nice uh, touch with the whole allusion to the Rolex watch that she's gifted and clearly uncomfortable about. And the fact that that's what Gruber's sort of clinging to on her wrist and unhooking it and setting it free is what causes him to fall off the building. It's kind of like a bit of a kind of subtext to that. But anyway, back to my... Uh... Now that bit's new. I like that. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, th I thought about that because like, I did think, like, why are you making such a big deal? And then when he wasn't falling, I was like, oh, the watch. Yeah, yeah, we can pick this up in a bit. Um, but no, my fact, which I will finally sort of get to. When they were setting up that stunt, 
uh, Alan Rickman had to fall about 20 feet onto a, an airbag. And he was quite nervous about doing that, having not really done stunts before, it being his first major picture. And the stunt guy, who was basically meant to count down and let go of him on three, and instead he let go of him on two. So Alan Rickman was totally unprepared. And the fall that you see, because you, you see his face and his reaction, is a real reaction to him falling because he wasn't expecting it and he was terrified. And they kept that edit in and that made the final cut. Love that. Love that. And uh, yeah, you know, that's uh, that's filmmaking. That's why we do these sorts of things because it's, um, it's, it's, it's just a joy to kind of find these further little facts. Um, a lot of little Easter eggs, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, that you, you can unpick. And uh, just to come to the the kind of, well, I think we should probably come to the the, the villains themselves in a bit, because uh, we've got some good examples of of, of, of the, the, the tropes here. I think to pick apart um, that that idea of the the the, the watch is, is an interesting one. So um, you know that maybe maybe it kind of links back to to my, my my Christmas movie idea, that idea of materialism and letting go of that. Um, you know, it's, it's literally the downfall uh, of people. Um, and, you know, it's not what matters at Christmas. Are you trying to post-rationalise this? <laughs> I am, yeah. Well, yeah. Hey, you're the, you're the one who threw the subtext at me. I'm just uh, trying to catch it. I play. You, you catch that grenade. I pulled the pin. I, I just want to note something before we move on to the next trope. There's some interesting things that are written down here. And I also noticed uh, you've got um, white FBI agent has skin like a lemon. <laughs> look okay i write these mainly for my my, my reference like I, I often forget but someone else is going to have to read and interpret the things i write i don't disagree yes. <laughs> <laughs> mate you should see my handwritten scrolls most of them are unintelligible um so yeah what uh what jim's alluding to is uh the cheat sheet that i've made um for the film of like it's a kind of like our structure and sort of things to talk about and remember and points of interest and references. Um, so one of the FBI agents, and for some reason, I don't know why they did this, but the two agents are both called Johnson and they make a point of the fact that they're not related because one is black and one is white. So it's, it's a very obvious joke. Um, I don't know why they did that and what they were trying to achieve with that. Um, but no, one of them, I can't remember what the actor's name is, um, but he also is the bad guy in um, License to Kill, the James Bond film with Timothy Dalton in it. And this guy has got, like, his skin just looks like a lemon. And it just makes me think of this guy that used to teach uh, cricket at my local village cricket club. And he had the exact same complexion. And I always thought, like, the man has the skin of a lemon. Right. That's as, deep as, that's as deep as it goes. I don't know if I was thinking that I was going to sort of start talking about the uh, dermatological state of the main players in Hollywood. I had no idea where I was going with that, but it's cropped up and I'm really glad. <laughs> and it, Well, that's, that's a fine observation nonetheless. And, uh, you know, we, we got to enjoy the uh, trip down memory lane there. You're welcome. <laughs> the goalposts, enduring image, isn't it? One thing that bothers me about this, I mean, you know, lemon-skinned policemen aside, how did they sneak an ambulance into that van? Oh, they probably did it like somewhere secure, like an underground car park or something. But they came in in that van, it was empty, and then it was... Well, how do you know it was empty? Because they, they arrived in it, didn't they? Yeah, but the, the ambulance could have been in the van when they arrived. Oh, they probably like drove the ambulance into the van somewhere secure, and then drove the van with the ambulance in it into the building car park. Yeah, that, that ambulance appears out of nowhere. I just, I, it just seems very like, oh, oh there's, a, there's an ambulance in there. And what I think is, is more weird is there's a few instances where we cut away to Argyle, who kindly waits for John McClane in case he needs a ride to the airport. And he's in the uh, basement garage, and he's making phone calls. He's listening to music quite loudly. So a lot of things, you know, he can miss from down there. But there's like major explosions, gunfire, all sorts going on before he realizes something is up. Yeah, it just must have run DMC on really loud. Yeah, like three, maybe deafeningly loud. That's the thing. He's, he's ruined his hearing. Yeah. And also the, the, the plan seems to hinge on the FBI cutting the power. Mm. Going by the FBI terrorism rule book. Playbook. Yeah. 
So if they don't... Yeah, but that's the thing, isn't it? Like, uh, Hans Gruber is so sure that they're just going to follow protocol. Because they're pencil-necked. Yeah, pencil push, paper pushing, pencil necked. I mean, there's also a weird sort of Vietnam uh, helicopter uh, reference as well, which is kind of bizarre. There's a few moments in this film where I'm kind of a bit really, but they don't you know detract from what is overall you know one of my favourite films. Yeah, I mean the the, the fire hose abseil as well is a great moment, isn't it? Um... <laughs> In his ridiculousness. I mean, it's in that sort of pomp of kind of. There's another bit in a. I think it's in Die Hard Four, where he uses taxi cab to take down a helicopter by basically driving it really fast at a ramp, jumping out, and it basically acts as like a missile into a helicopter. And then he says, "I ran out of bullets." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it, that's that is the there's a there's a hyper reality about these films that they they get away with. Um, uh, especially, especially this one, because uh, it, it's just believable enough. A lot of it to to kind of, you know, oh, this guy is this, you know, because he gets absolutely torn to shreds, uh, McLean, throughout it. So you, you kind of believe him enough to. Whereas towards towards the the, the latter half of this um, franchise, he, he becomes a bit more sort of like you can just shoot a bullet straight through him and he's he's fine um, from point blank range. Whereas it, it, here he's a little bit more. Uh, Sort of vulnerable and fallible, but you know, it's there, there's some great there's some great action uh, in this, and there's got you got that weird scene with the the, the the weirdest way of trying to kill McLean possible. There's like a chase where he's under the tables and the other guy's on top <laughs> of the tables, and it's just it's, going about the most contrived way of trying to shoot someone under a table you could possibly. He even says like in a really awful accent, just like no more table. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like oh Christ. And it's just yeah, the sort of setup as well. Like when you have the chance to kill someone, don't hesitate. Well, how about that? That's Chris's second trope. Thank you for listening. The the next trope I'm going to move on to talk about is uh, talking about the big guy himself, as you said, uh, Hans Gruber, the big bad. Um, he is, or oh, how much does he measure up as your sort of archetypal card calorie? Ca- carrying villain one thing i thought about this was the use that making them german i did wonder a little bit if there was sort of a weird hangover of kind of second world war germans are still the bad guys like why they went with german like why why were they german and not something else i don't know i don't know. maybe i'm looking for something that's not really there maybe i'm being a sensitive snowflake about all of this and uh Maybe their nationality is irrelevant. Um, but they no, make his... awful, they make an awful lot of them German to <laughs> like blonde hair and everything to try and. They were kind of in a, a fairly Aryan ger- German mold. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> dodgy accents and everything and haircuts. And uh, yeah, they're kind of like, I, I think what uh, an American imagines a trendy Berliner to look like in the mid late 80s. But um, yeah, Hans Gruber is an interesting one. I think he falls into the sort of sociopath category. He's quite charismatic. When he's he's quite he's obviously high, uh, he alludes to his education as well. He's he's well educated. He's smart. He's successful in what he does. He's part, or he was part of a left wing uh, socialist German terrorist organization. He's quite senior in it. Uh, likes nicely tailored suits from London and uh, tries to strike up some banter with Takagi as well and sees them probably as equals and well-heeled men. He plays it very cool until things start not going his way when he kind of loses his cool and blows his top and starts kind of acting quite disproportionately violent or aggressive to sort of problems as they arise. Like shooting Takagi, shooting Ellis. I mean, Ellis didn't really deserve to die, but he was kind of being used as leverage to sort of smoke John McClane out, which didn't work. But yeah, he has very little regard for human life and hesitancy in killing people, which, considering he uses Holly McClane as a hostage, I'm surprised that he didn't just shoot her sooner, given his kind of previous form. 
Yeah, she has a bit of like plot armor, doesn't she? I suppose in that she can't really. I mean, we we kind of get the idea of where the plot's going with with this estranged element that is going to it's going to resolve in that sort of way. Having watched you know enough of these things, um, so we kind of get the idea that she's going to stay the course. Um, whereas who knows when Gruber's around more sort of expendable characters like the uh, the Japanese businessman and. Uh, and Ellis, like you say, and his um, old armada of goons, which are uh, he doesn't really sort of uh, mourn the loss of any of his like countrymen. Like uh, when Carl's brother dies, he's just like, oh, and tell Carl his brother's dead. Like, there was very little remorse or you know, no grieving or like obvious emotion about it. It's just another expendable grunt has gone to the wall. It's only when sort of things really start to mess with his plans that he actually gets irate about it and sort of acts out so what about his plan does it, is, does it valid does it does it because he's supposed to be quite educated quite clever quite suave quite charming well yeah i mean he he makes out as a front that they're sort of a politically minded organization when he gives out his list of people around the world who are incarcerated that he feels um should be freed and unless their terms are met he's gonna blow up the building or whatever and kill all these people and that's basically just a smokescreen for what is basically a heist when they're stealing over half a billion dollars worth of um, negotiable bonds from the bank vault, which is what they're trying to break into Ocean's Eleven style. So he's, he's motivated by greed. You know, it plays out to the, the capitalist uh, narrative that we've discussed previously. He doesn't really give two shits about all of these other causes and he even says as much as well that it's just a it's basically just a front um and also he has a sort of he's cold and calculating enough to come up with a, a double cross of faking their own deaths that's the intended plan anyway as part of their escape so that no one goes looking for them because they're presumed dead there's I, one thing we haven't mentioned yet is the, the faked accent scene where they actually <sighs> finally come face to face uh yeah and there's like a double 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 cross isn't there kind of thing yeah so uh at one point they him and john mcclain bump into each other quite literally and john mcclain uh oh and and hans gruber puts on a fake accent pretends to be one of the hostages that's escaped and john mcclain offers him a weapon Bob. uh, bob and uh he basically tries to shoot John McClain, but it's because the gun's not loaded, there's no bullets. And I wonder, like, was that a setup by McClain? Like, was he just being smart and being, like, testing him just to see whether or not, you know, this person could be trusted? Because they do strike up, they share a cigarette, they sort of exchange some dialogue, you know. And it's pretty wise up to sort of, like, have the, the forethought to do that. Well, maybe McClain's just a very wise and street cop and doesn't trust anybody. Well, I think that's I think that's the intention, uh, but yeah, it's, it, it's you're not led to believe that by the filmmaker early on. It's kind of this idea that he's very much been tricked by Hans Gruber. So it's it's quite a neat little interplay and and subversion of the, the expectations that you have there. That it's really good acting, I think, on the front of uh, on behalf of Rickman because he goes from having this kind of dopey looking face that he pulls to all of a sudden that veneer falls off and you get the, 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 the sort of thousand yard stare of Hans Gruber again, once McLean's back's turned and he kind of levels the gun at him in a really, really calm and calculated fashion, um, only for it to not to fire. Uh, and it's, it's a, it's a really, really quite tense and well shot scene. I think that when the, the actors do a good job of it. It's interesting you say that though, cause I, um, in the research, um, I read the, that scene, they, they did it quite a few times because the director wasn't happy with um, Alan Rickman's fake American accent. He thought he kept sounding too British or even veering back into German. And he just thought Rickman wasn't doing a good American accent at all. And whether that's, you know, because it's meant to be Hans Gruber doing a fake American accent. So it kind of ties together in that way. But apparently... A little sort of another nugget to add on to that. The bit where um, Hans Gruber jumps down and almost jumps into John McClane, when they did that scene, 
um, Alan Rittman fell awkwardly and damaged his knee quite badly and had to have surgery. And so in that scene, he's basically got a leg brace on under his suit and he's leaning quite awkwardly against the wall to support himself. And he's actually apparently in quite a lot of pain. <laughs> so it just adds so much more to that whole scene. Die Hard, yeah. It, it fits. Everything about this fits. It just, it just seemed a real labour of... Uh... Of, of love, blood, sweat, and tears. This this film, which you know, you've got to respect it for that, I suppose. So yeah, that's uh, that's Gruber covered. Um, he does have like every sort of. He's he's also as well as being a card carrying. He, he's the big bad. He's the man with the plan. He rarely gets his hands dirty in the same way the 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 goon squad do. The German. I mean, he's he's got at least two murders to his name. Yeah, but he's not going into rooms just open up. You know, alg alg rifles gunfire everywhere into into rooms and you know he'd he, he sooner send a, a goon off to do his bidding rather than uh rather than do it himself i think but yeah you're right he's he's show, when he's when he's shown to be you know he needs to end somebody of significance he'll do it now jim's second drum. the dragon now we had we had this in a in a storm and a tea break before about what what a dragon is and I, this may have got mentioned i'm not sure but if if it didn't then it's quite remiss of me, really, uh, not to do it because Carl is very much your sort of archetypal uh, dragon, and um, you know these are these sort of characters. They often don't say very much. Um, they they they're, they're physically imposing. They're like the muscle uh, element behind the brains of the big bad character, who's who usually leads the. Uh, they're, they're kind of the what, the reason they call the dragon is because they can they're just like a, a sort of monster or a force that they can set uh, and unleash on. Uh, unwitting or witting uh, protagonists. Cisco style. Yep. Dumps like a truck. <laughs> so glad you got that reference. <laughs> and also, I'd like to query, uh, they don't say much, he's got some fantastic lines of dialogue, has our Carl, like, uh, no one kills him but me. What a great line. I mean, it's a great line, but they're, they're very sort of uh, simple sentence structures, aren't they? It's, it's they, they kind of... Well, I mean, Karl is actually one of the other only Germans. He's not even German, actually. He's Russian by birth. Um, so to feature in the film. So, you know, English not as a mother tongue. Yeah. And I suppose that kind of, you know, this, this idea that he only says the things that he needs to say. Um, that I, no, you're right. The no one kills him but me line is because his, his younger brother gets killed, I believe, uh, mm -hmm. earlier on. And so that, for that reason, it becomes a bit of, a, you know, an act of vengeance. And um, the really interesting thing about uh, Carl within this is because he actually gets the drop on McLean uh, and, and doesn't instantly uh, instantly kill him for some reason. Um, probably because he wants to try and make him suffer, as they, they mm. usually do. Yeah, uh, James Bond sort of like, you know, uh, sharks with lasers on their head or the incredibly slow dipping mechanism. Yeah, these, it's like it, they're a bit like the Terminator or like the Terminator films where he just kind of throws them around for a bit. You know, he could probably just punch the head in two, but he doesn't. He throws them like across the room for a bit, whilst they figure out what goes what goes on. Um, you've, got to, you've got to soften them up a bit first. Exactly. Well, I think that's what Carl is aiming to do with McLean. He wants to tenderize this guy, um, and you know, you could argue he does that quite successfully. And then there's this really strange fight sequence with a, a set of chains, uh, which is, is properly brutal. Uh, on, on both sides, but then you know we've got the the, the you know McLean's not he's not the most noble of, of kind of protagonists really is he? he he will be willing to fight dirty and he's got no problem <laughs> lynching this guy with with the 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 chain by the end of it and and, and leaving him to to hang um, which he appears very very much dead so that you know the, the dragon of the piece has been vanquished um, or so we think. Well, yeah, I mean, that alludes nicely to the Jesus-style resurrection and how he comes back from this. I'll never know, because he gets, like, strung up in metal chains, his eyes bulging out of his skull and left for, well, dead. There's no coming back from that, or is there? So, I mean, Gruber, Gruber's fell to his death, hasn't he, at this mm. point? So we're we're, we're post-Gruber at this point. He's out of the picture, and then you get, uh, which is quite interesting, because oft often... You get a resurgent death of a uh, resurgent um, main villain often um, or monster. You know, you think it's been vanquished and then it'll come come at the end. And mm. uh, this this guy, as you say, looks very much dead, 
like dead as they get um <laughs> without his head falling off it, it just, we, we, we're shown it's that idea of you know people dying if you don't see people physically die on screen then they're not dead is, is often the rule but this this guy looks you know he has been killed full-on killed <laughs> to all intents and purposes like yeah he's he's gone he's he's vanquished he's at the great uh october fest in the sky at this point and um until he isn't and then he just you know it's all good you've got this kind of false happy ending um to th then um you get this jesus resurrection of carl the dragon and he's like a wailing banshee isn't he he just sort of like just comes back screaming or screeching like covered in blood with a big machine gun and then he's uh he's dispatched you know, he's dispatched with a plom uh, to beautifully uh, finish Sergeant Al Powell's narrative story arc of redemption from shooting a kid to saving the day. Ultimately, he's, he's the one who literally does um, save everybody because um, that could have that gone badly. This guy seems invincible. He's got a yeah. assault got, rifle. Yeah, it's, it's pure exoneration. Yeah. So, and then, and then of course, you get the, uh, the driving off in the limo. Yeah, not to hospital by the looks of it. <laughs> not know. to sort out back to, you know, a gangrene or the sepsis or, you know, whatever else. Counseling, anything. Like, there's nothing. <laughs> there's no kind of, like, he's just, like, allowed to leave. It's kind of like, where's, like, the medics, the police? Why is he not having, like, a, a briefing? Like, he's just kind of allowed to just sort of ride off into the sunset in a really beaten up uh, limo. I need your clothes, your boots, and you to subscribe to the Tropes Thomas podcast. Do it now. Well, on that note, I think it brings us time to score this, mother. Indeed, it is time. The action man, every man trope, was it? Yeah, I mean, when we discussed that, we, we were going about to the, the box ticking exercise. Mm. And there's like a balance to strike, I feel, here. Um you know what the, the the filmmakers probably were aiming for, and what what was that they wanted it to be relatable, but also, um, you know, tick those boxes of being the man of action, the man who can do the things not ev not every man can do. Um, and I guess it's whether that balance is struck because he ticks all the action man boxes for sure, but but he kind of subverts it though, doesn't he? Like, can you think of a John McClane type? in a previous movie action blockbuster i mean in the 80s and early 90s as we've discussed previously on this podcast it was a saturated market of muscles grunts and and mary sueism mary sueism and I, I would i would you know i will die on the hill i suppose that you know we, we asked is he a mary sue which is cardinal sin isn't it on this podcast that that, that much is clear that as a red card you know, is, is this person invincible? Do they have plot armor? Just do they, um, are they instantly good at everything they do? And, you know, the guy is pulling shards of glass out of his feet and he blows everyone's kingdom come in the first instance. Um, he gets his machine gun and then drops it. So after even as he's had that, I, ho, 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 I have a machine gun. Uh, yeah, he loses so, it. He just loses it straight away. So, you know, you, you, you he, he can't be accused really of, of being that, that Mary Sue. And you know, he's quite a competent cop. Uh, he's quite a competent cop, but um, he, a Mary Sue he ain't. You know, he's, he, he also can uh, be fallible. And, uh, and, and, and it's, you're right, it's, it's, it's subverted for the better, in my opinion. Hmm. It's not like a lazy sort of action man trope where you just, you know this guy or girl, if it's a heroine, um, is just going to be the victor and you know, it's going to come about in a fairly obvious fashion, um, probably quite in a bombastic, unimaginative way. Uh, like we've said so far with this, like there is that everyman thread to his character. Um, and I, 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 I think it's all the better for it. I think it's an, a, a subverted and original take on what an action hero can be. It's not your sort of uh, gold standard action hero of the 80s. But it's kind of a, a reimagining of it, and I'll, I'll go one further. I think and say that um, this is probably this this arc created its own archetype. It's like this kind of um, genre of its own because it reminds me of 
I think about subsequent films that got very similar. Um, so Air Force One with Harrison Ford. Um, mm -hmm. It's really interesting that he turned down this part and then he's doing Air Force One where he's this kind of a politician, you know, so fish out of water in that situation, but he's, he's, he, he plays the, the, the president who has to fight his way off Air Force One. Um, in a very similar situation, you've got a foreign sounding terrorist type played by Gary Oldman, who is a very, very, very in, much in the mold of Hans Gruber. Uh, and then you've got this uh, reluctant badass in um, Harrison Ford in Air Force One. And the, the, the parallels between these two films, you know, they're about 10 years apart between them. Um, it's basically Die Hard on, a, on, on Air Force One. Uh, so I, I think, and, and that was, that's been repeated uh, as well, you know, with um, other, other films where, um, you, you know, there's, there's the, I'm, I'm trying to think of examples now. That's probably the best one I can think of. So I might cut this. <laughs> no, solid, a solid, solid yeah. reference. I agree. I think it has spawned a lot of uh, imitations uh, or copycats along the way. Which moves us nicely on to our second trope. Is definitively, is this a Christmas film? Well, there's a Christmas jumper with I have a machine gun, ho, ho, ho on it. It's got Christmas in Hollis. Uh, there's a Let Christmas party, Let It Snow. There's also it's set at Christmas. It's set at Christmas. And we've also got, as you mentioned to earlier, the kind of subversion of um, kind of capitalism, as well as having a message of kind of togetherness and redemption and this idea that, you know, there's fresh starts for people in the new year and all those sort of things with, um, you know, the, uh, the, the Sergeant, Sergeant Powell's, uh, redemption. I think there is, there is a feel good factor to the end of this movie, despite all the kind of the brutalism that's in it. Um, I, I do think, you know, as a subversion, as a, you, you can't accuse this of, of, of playing to type where Christmas films are concerned, but it has a lot of the elements. You know, you couldn't even go as far as there's a kind of Grinch presence in uh, Hans Gruber. Um, so, you know, he's, he's trying to spoil people's Christmases, but at the same time, he's trying to, you know, a poke in the eye for the, the kind of capitalist nature of it as well. So, you know, at the risk of sounding like a, a socialist podcast. Uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that Hans Gruber goes out of his way to spoil Christmas. I think that's a stretch. Well, yeah, maybe, maybe I'm reaching a little bit there. But I think, based on what we said, we've got enough for two points here uh, for the good. It's it's looking that way, yeah. And uh, moving on to the third trope, which was discussing uh, Hans Gruber as your archetypal um, car carrying villain of Germanic descent. Um, I mean, for his, his debut in Hollywood, his feature film debut, his Hollywood debut, Alan Rittman really, for me, like pulls it off probably to a point where he became kind of typecast for his portrayal. You know, he, uh, he was the sheriff of Nottingham where he stole the show in Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Um, he's kind of, yeah, he's, he's become, you know, one of the pantheon of British baddies, um, in films and played it very well. Yeah, the sort of British, slightly German, German but slightly British, foreign but slightly British uh, baddies. Yeah, mm. they're, they're, it's they, they've become a staple, haven't they, of, of Hollywood? I guess you could, I guess you could argue, you know, is it a bit? Do, do you get away with it because it's Alan Rickman and because it's such a good example of this? You know, as as a as a trope, the idea of having a foreign card carrying villain. You know, it is quite lazy, isn't it? Yeah, this idea is 1988, so the Berlin Wall's still up. You've got this East German, possibly, uh, villain who... But then ultimately, he doesn't care, does he? It's quite this idea of... The, they, they kind of play with the old tropes of the politics of... Because everybody's kind of a bit grubby in this, aren't they? You know, nobody's, nobody's like a white knight. He's not really like... A... He's not fighting for a cause. He's just, he's a bank robber at the end of the day. He's an exceptional thief, as he says. The rest of it's just smoke and mirrors. It's just, it's all a sort of a con trick to sort of misdirection towards the police force to make them sort of what tie them up in knots trying to politically execute the unexecutable. He knows full well that's not possible. Uh, all the while, you know, it aids his kind of getaway and his plan. 
you know, he's a he's a sociopathic gun for hire, but he's he's the one in charge. Okay. Well, I, I think you know that's probably quite a convincing argument to say he's a bit more complex than we probably you know you could initially take him for. I think he has a bit more depth than maybe a lot of villains. You know, I think the little nuances of kind of like when he's talking to Takagi about men's fashion and uh, engineering and stuff like that, like there is a sort of depth in his kind of slightly camp portrayal. Um, but then there's also that sort of very cold streak that runs through him, you know, where he doesn't doesn't miss a beat in shooting someone once they serve their purpose. And he's got a great death as well. As, and as he had it beautifully explored by yourself. Okay, uh, so that leaves us with the, the final trope of the of the episode. Well, it's it's looking like a bit of a Christmas miracle at this at the minute, uh, because I don't know, like he this this guy as in terms of being a dragon, you know, the the subordinate, the capable subordinate to the the, the big bad. Um, he kind of ticks the boxes, right? I mean, he even gets a bonus Jesus resurrection. I think that oh. is, is that daft or is that, does that kind of serve the, the character? Mm, I'm, I'm, <laughs> there's no way of watching this without it being daft. Like, like we said, he is strung up and left for dead and he looks like he is, he is well on his way to checking out and meeting Peter at the gates. Like, how 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 did he get down from there how did he evade everybody how did he get among the people and you know there's so many unanswered questions with this um i kind of feel like carl is much more played to type in what you'd expect a grunty goony villain to be there's no depth to carl we don't learn anything about him we learn he's pissed off that his brother dies you'd be a bit worried if he wasn't um but there's no none of the goons have any kind of character window dressing do they there's nothing superfluous about any of them apart from maybe the the guy who's cracking the vault he's got a bit more character but still we don't learn a lot about him and it's a bit like that austin powers bit where um the one of the goons dies and you see his widow and his kid and they get told that he died in service and stuff, and they're really sad. And it's it's that <laughs> idea that these <laughs> these they're still people at the end of the day. But outside of Hans Gruber, most of the bad guys aren't really given a lot a lot of personality, screen time, or explanation as to their motives or anything like that. Well, we've just we've just discussed at great length whether you know the villain has sufficient depth. I suppose depending how generous we are this christmas i mean it's it's looking like a, a utopia for uh die hard anyway hmm. um there's no there's no way that it can score badly at this point it's how how thorough are we going to be do we think that you have to treat a villain and their dragon in the same way as each other or is there it, it is it their scope for a flatter character when you're looking at a, a dragon okay I, I see where you're going with this um Throw some more dragons at me, and we'll do a comparative study quickly. Right, well, there's an argument that, that Darth Vader is a dragon, in the sense that, and you, you, we could argue that he has more depth than your your average kind of goon. And really, he's 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 a, he's a top tier villain, really, isn't he? So yeah, but we've had more time to explore him in depth over three films. But he has a lot more depth to him. He's conflicted. So any any Bond muscle. So I'm talking about the guy with the like Jaws, uh, yeah, like Jaws or Odd Job, or Job or the uh, the guy in the one of the recent um, ones with the spiky thumbs, spiky thumbs Jaws, spiky thumbs Jaws. <laughs> Dave Bautista plays him. Oh, he doesn't even have any dialogue, does he? No, he just yeah, he pretty much just basically tries to claw people's eyes out. So, but like they tend to be just like a physical threat. At least he gets he gets a bit of a an arc, I suppose, with his trying to get vengeance for his brother. I mean, okay, am I, am I pointy story mount in that one? But am I trying to add a little bit more where not normally nothing more exists? Is I suppose that what that's what I'm getting at. Is that what we're trying to pick apart? Is whether it's whether it's entirely necessary? Like it's not important for me to know whether that Carl is a Taurus or a Scorpio. <laughs> you know, he's blatantly a Libra anyway. Um, you know that sort of thing. 
no point to go, Carl, what are you thinking? <laughs> Carl, did you shoot that guy? Carl, we've talked about this. It's just a lot of repressed rage from the fact your father didn't love you enough. Do you need to talk to someone? Should we, should we go get, should we, should we go get a biscuit? Come on, you and me, let's get a biscuit. We'll talk this out. It's not gay. Um, yeah. Okay. Maybe I'm, I'm trying, maybe my dragon expectations are too high. I'm looking for the sort of Fiera Rocher of, uh, dragons at the ambassador's reception. And you're basically giving me Poundland dragon. This is the orc. What's the orc who kills Boromir? He's a, he's a dragon, like Sar he's Saruman's dragon, isn't he? And in, in if we want to bring it to like recent examples that we've looked at, like with, Lord of the Rings and you know my weakness. You you targeted me there, didn't you? I see. I see what you've done here. You brought out some Lord of the Rings, uh, the two towers. I see what you did. The closer Sneaky. I get to Helm's Deep, oh, you bastard! <laughs> <laughs> I invoked the Helm's Deep clause. Ah, <laughs> oh, damn it! I've got a leg to stand on. Um, right. Well, there you go. That's that's told me, didn't it? Um, so. What are, what are the scores on the doors? Is that a clean sweep? It's a clean yippee ki -yay motherfucker sweep for Die Hard, I believe. And, you know, what a Christmas miracle. Uh, uh, it's a, this, is a, this, is, this is our gift to all of you, dear listeners. Um, you're welcome. Merry Christmas. Because I think we probably get a load of, cop a lot of flack for, for uh, throwing shade on this film. But it's not stopped us before. So... Hey, so, we make the, we make the tough decisions so other people don't have to. Yeah, have they caught us on a on a on a Christmas sort of generosity day? Perhaps that's for you to decide. If you if you want to let us know uh, what you think about the film um, or the films that we look at, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, where can people find us, Chris? Uh, we are on the social medias at Trope Stormers, and if you feel so inclined to write to us, we'd love to hear from you. It's tropestormers at gmail dot com. Yeah, we heard from some people about their um, their film experiences and their film going experiences, and we, we love hearing about that. So, uh, yeah, all, all the more for that. And, uh, yeah, you might feature on the show. Mm -hmm. We'll see you trope storming into 2021, Chris. We've got a, a cheeky little bowl on the horizon. Reboots. And it's not the uh, animated series that featured on ITV when we were children. Yeah, we're going on from the franchise sequels and we're thinking about the, uh, I suppose, the good, the bad, the different, the hot takes on the idea of the reboot. So, And, and the not takes. Uh, that didn't really work in my head. That sounded a lot better than it would be when you said <laughs> hot takes and I'd be like, the not takes. Hot, oh yeah, hot, hot, hot takes and not takes. Got you, got you. No, yeah. Right, okay. I mean, the, the wall of silence that I got there and I felt <laughs> I had to explain myself. Cool, well, we'll be back for then. Yeah, so Bond style, the Trope Stormers will return. As we always say here on Trope Stormers, FBI agent has skin like a lemon. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Happy trails.